When I read this book written by a respected professor of hematology who noted that iron is the most common nutrient deficiency in the world, especially in developing countries, one sentence really caught my attention. As a doctor practicing in the US, I can honestly say that I have never encountered a patient whose diet was the sole cause of their iron deficiency. What? How did I get the impression that iron was like vitamin C? Eat healthy, maybe take a supplement, and usually you'll be fine. So I dug deeper with this thick book written by leaders of the field who have a banner right across the top saying anemia is a symptom, not a diagnosis. They also stopped me in my tracks by claiming that too much iron is more dangerous than too little, and the leading symptom is the same, fatigue. So a lot of people are inadvertently taking iron supplements to fix their iron overload problems. What? Why didn't I know this either? When I read the answer they gave, I facepalmed. Ugh! It's nearly universal for people to equate fatigue or anemia with a need for iron. No doubt this bias exists because of one of the most successful marketing campaigns of the 20th century. J.B. Williams' company, one of the smaller drug companies of the 50s, needed a gimmick to sell one of its products, a multivitamin called Geritol. Instead of selling it for what it was, a nutritional supplement for iron deficiency, the company decided to sell it as a quick fix for fatigue. Twice the iron in a whole pound of calf's liver. Really, in only one day, Geritol iron is in your bloodstream carrying strength and energy to every part of your body. Brace yourself for some serious culture shock. tired because of iron poor blood. Geritol can help you feel stronger fast. Maybe not this fast, but fast. You may say, oh come on, what kind of idiot would fall for an ad like that? Well, how about one like this from one of America's most admired women, Betty White? Because remember, that weak, rundown condition may be due to undernourished blood. Doctors have a special name for it. They call it iron deficiency anemia. But we call it tired blood. And to feel stronger fast, I wish you'd give Geritol a try. No, I don't blame Betty. She was just the actress, and she was a national treasure. The number one Betty White tip for living a long and happy life. Don't waste your time watching this crap. Oh, yeah. Geritol ads were banned by the Federal Trade Commission after a 17-year court battle, but those ads have had a deep and lasting legacy a half century later. This book was compiled by the Iron Disorders Institute, so I went and bought others of their books, like Exposing the Hidden Dangers of Iron, with a banner across the top claiming it's underdiagnosed and deadly. I also read their book on hemochromatosis, with a banner across the top saying it's common and it can kill you. What? These are respected scientists who are normally reserved and boring, creating sensational headlines like that? In this episode, I'll take you to the very gates of hell. And that's because they're right here. We're at Stanford in the Rodin Garden, and that's his famous sculpture of the gates of hell. Some of the characters in his sculpture look like they have serious iron disorders. You probably thought I was gonna use the gates of hell as a metaphor to scare you about parasites who suck your blood to make you anemic, or the toxic dangers of too much iron. I am. So you're probably wondering, what are you doing on Stanford's campus, Chris? And the answer is, you seem to enjoy me wandering aimlessly through the forest, talking to my camera before with people pointing and saying, That guy's really weird. So I decided to do it again in one of my favorite places on Earth, where I was a graduate student and also a visiting scientist about 10 years later. In part one of this episode, we'll talk about anemia. In part two, iron overload. And in part three, what's to do about this conundrum? Part one, the thing that leapt out at me in reading these books, some of which were intended for physicians, is how far above my pay grade diagnosing the causes of anemia can be. I don't care how strong your science background is, unless you've been to medical school and have some experience with the diseases that cause anemia, there's just no substitute for a great doctor. For example, you may notice from a recent ferritin test that your ferritin levels went up since the last time you had them checked, and you may take that as a good sign that your supplements are working. 
ferritin is like the gas in the tank of your car. So the higher your ferritin levels, the higher the iron in your body is, right? How complicated can this be? Very complicated, it turns out. Your body has a natural reaction to inflammation, which come from invaders like the bacteria H. pylori, which want to penetrate your stomach lining and suck your blood. Those nasty little vampires. Just like the body can raise its temperature in response to viruses in an attempt to smoke them out, it can pull iron out of hemoglobin and store it in ferritin for safe storage to try to starve out cancer cells in H. pylori. Hemoglobin, by the way, is a container that transports oxygen around the blood with some help from iron. It's where 70% of the iron in our bodies is. And as long as we're defining terms, what the heck is hematocrit? Hemoglobin and hematocrit are a little bit like Celsius and Fahrenheit. They're just different ways of describing the same thing. So when we notice that our hemoglobin count is down, what do we do? We talk to our Facebook friends who tell us we need a new brand of iron pills and we go to Costco. And the body says, hey, I'm working here trying to fight off H. pylori. What even is this ferrous sulfate chemical you're putting in my stomach that's giving me nausea and constipation? Ew. And while we're talking, can we please stop with the fortified cereals? Ferrous sulfate, ah! And that guy needs help. Boy, I'm glad I'm not his wife. Okay, you say, but the most common deficiencies are among premenopausal women, right? That's right, and for centuries they've had some pretty good folk cures. Hmm, I might get fatigued walking around with this heavy camera, so maybe I should stop and get a shot of iron. Fortunately, I went medieval on this apple yesterday. Mmm, black holes. Oh, baby. You know, I'm picking up subtle tones of um, rusted rake. I don't actually need more iron in my body. My ferritin's already at 91. That's a tradition that was passed down for centuries from mother to daughter to help with iron deficiency. Seriously though, the arithmetic of iron in the body is very eye-opening. The average woman has 3.5 grams of iron in her body, that's 3,500 milligrams, and my nails are five grams. So we'll saw off a little bit to better represent what's in her. She can lose 500 milligrams to her fetus when she gives birth and maybe 250 milligrams or more in blood. Studies show monthly cycles can vary wildly between women from 30 milliliters of blood to 180 milliliters, a six-fold difference. That could be 15 to 90 milligrams of iron, more often than once a month in some women. Fortunately, our bodies have a really good mechanism to adjust for blood loss, so a woman can go from absorbing one milligram a day to as much as 3.5 milligrams. That is, unless she's taking something like calcium supplements, which can interfere with iron absorption. And even 3.5 milligrams a day is not enough if she's having frequent heavy cycles. If that's the case, a doctor may put her on oral contraceptives to minimize blood loss, but now I'm talking way above my pay grade again. That arithmetic recently came in very handy when my wife's ferritin dropped to nine and her Stanford-educated doctor scurried to find the cause. But I, with my newfound hematology math skills, made the diagnosis. Turns out my wife had given blood five times over the last 10 months at the Red Cross. And according to the Red Cross, you lose as much as 250 milligrams of blood every time you donate. Another thing that stopped me in my tracks in these books is the rate of anemia among infants. And it's not because the mothers are anemic, because the body somehow regulates the amount of iron very tightly in breast milk. I was stunned to read in all the books that the leading cause of anemia in infants less than two years old is cow's milk. Apparently the proteins in cow's milk are so irritating to immature digestive systems that they lose a little blood that the mothers don't pick up in their poops. These authors weren't radical vegans with an agenda. Apparently it's just common knowledge among hematologists and pediatricians. And here's the really dark thing. When an infant suffers from anemia, it slows brain development and the effect is permanent. They never recover. I cringe when I see the dairy ads targeting young mothers. Moms know their kids need love and encouragement. They also know milk is a nutrient powerhouse. I searched the Dairy Council's website for cautionary notes about feeding our babies with cow's milk and causing permanent cognitive damage. And here's the latest. Does that look like caution to you? It looks like promotion to me. Despite the struggles with iron that premenopausal women have, they are the healthiest population in Western countries. That is until they reach menopause when their need for iron drops dramatically, but their supplementation habits sometimes don't. And that brings up part two, poisoning ourselves with iron as if mercury and lead weren't enough. Oh, sorry, it wasn't fair to compare iron to mercury and lead. 
the body has a way to rid itself of mercury and lead where it doesn't with iron. My apologies, mercury and lead. Oh, you think I'm exaggerating? Well, there's a great book by a PhD in metal toxicity, Jim Moon, calling iron the most toxic metal. Let's look at a paper published by Christina Ellervik, a professor at Harvard Medical School, that looks at ferritin levels in the blood versus mortality. The trends are fascinating. This chart shows the median age of death versus ferritin levels. It's from the Copenhagen Heart Study of about 9,000 people followed for 23 years, during which more than 6,000 of them died. The horizontal axis is how long they lived. The vertical axis is the percent that died. The four lines show different ferritin ranges. The solid black line represents people who had a ferritin level below 200. Their median age of death was 79. The heavy dashed line is for people with ferritin levels between 200 and 400. Their median age of death was 76, three years sooner. The median age of death for people with ferritin between 400 and 600 was 72, seven years sooner than people with ferritin below 200. And for people whose ferritin exceeded 600, the median age of death was 55. They also reported the cause of death, and it was roughly 60% from heart disease, 30% from cancer, and 10% from diabetes, all strongly correlated to ferritin levels. Here's the issue. People with high ferritin usually accumulated their iron slowly since age 20 with men and around 45 for women when they stop menstruating. You're probably wondering why humans never evolved with a mechanism to get rid of their excess iron. And the answer is we evolved in a different way. Our bodies evolved with a mechanism to adjust the uptake of iron from the food that we eat according to our needs, but our modern food environment is defeating that mechanism. There are only two forms of iron which occur naturally in food. Non-heme iron occurs in plants and dairy, and heme iron occurs in flesh foods like chicken, fish, and especially red meat. The body has to convert the non-heme form found in plants to the heme form found in hemoglobin. It's called hemoglobin for a reason. The body can greatly increase the uptake of iron from plants during times of blood loss, but crucially, it can downregulate the uptake of iron when the body says, that's enough, I have enough iron. It cannot downregulate the uptake of iron from meat. And then there are supplements. We all learn from Geritol that we need a lot of iron every day, like in a pound of calf's liver, especially when we get fatigued. And what better way to get crushing fatigue than to let your ferritin levels get too high? And if you have hemochromatosis, a genetic predisposition to absorb too much iron, which a million people in the United States have, it's a disaster to mistake your fatigue for anemia and take iron supplements or eat a lot of meat to fix it. According to a survey conducted by the CDC, of over 2,000 people who suffer from hemochromatosis, 30% of them were taking iron supplements to combat their fatigue. Ugh, I know this is tragic and hard to hear, but hang into part three, because iron overload is usually easily preventable and oftentimes reversible in most people. Right now, you must be wondering if I'm right about this, and many of you will ask for a book recommendation. The thing is, I struggle to get through the Iron Disorders Institute book on too much iron because it's written for physicians and I couldn't understand all the obscure diseases and medications. I've owned this book, Iron in Your Heart, for a very long time, and it's superb, written by a professor at Harvard University, but it's copyright 1993. Not much has changed since then, but it's out of print. You'd have to buy it used. I don't know if the screen is bright enough on my iPad for you to see this book by P.D. Mangan. All my biases screamed at me about P.D. because he's a fitness trainer, not a scientist, and that's pretty ironic considering one of my heroes is Jack LaLanne, a fitness guru and not a scientist. With P.D. showing off his ripped 60-something body, I was predisposed to think he'd lean into a high meat diet and would treat iron like Nina Teicholz and Paul Saladino do, with crickets and science denial. So I was relieved to discover that to his credit, P.D. really did follow the scientists and hematologists. Several of the most respected scientists in the field endorsed his book. He says very clearly, you will have to forego steak and burgers to get your iron down, and he promotes a Mediterranean diet. Honestly, I find it unconscionable that with one million people having hemochromatosis in the U.S., and with such high ferritin levels in the population, Nina and Paul promote the thing that creates so much of the problem, overconsumption of beef. So many men are drawn to beef for reasons of masculinity, but one of the leading symptoms of high ferritin is impotence and lack of libido, because iron gets in the family jewels in a form very similar to rust and essentially rusts them out. Once the body can't store any more iron in ferritin and hemoglobin, it gets in the liver, kidneys, heart, and brain, too. I did an episode about Nina Teicholz where I showed pretty convincing evidence, I think, that she's a well-paid lobbyist for the beef industry on the down low, 
which explains why she sounds so much like Geritol and the Dairy Council. So that brings up part three. What are we to do? Well, let's pick iron overload first because that's usually the easiest to solve and we could use some good news right about now. The first thing to do is to get a simple ferritin test. They're cheap and they're easy. The normal range in the United States is considered to be between 20 and 300. Although most of the research I could find says 20 to 100 is safer. I couldn't find any evidence anywhere that at ferritin levels above 100, any bodily function got better. The experts universally suggest not eating fortified processed foods. Most books I read suggested a whole food plant dominant diet the way the Mediterranean diet was before the invasion of all the processed foods and such a high meat content. And here's the good news you've been waiting for. This isn't like going to the doctor and finding out you have high cholesterol or high blood sugar and it's probably gonna involve medications. A few trips to the Red Cross or the Stanford Bloodmobile will have a dramatic effect on lowering the ferritin levels of most men and postmenopausal women who have accumulated a lifetime of iron. It's simple hematology arithmetic, and the Danish government has created a chart of what happens to your ferritin levels after just a few blood donations. It's dramatic. And speaking of the Stanford Bloodmobile, look what just pulled up by the student union. Maybe we can give blood today. I haven't given for a couple of months. Hey, how are you doing, boss? I'm good. All right. Nice of you to take me without an appointment. I just saw the Bloodmobile, and 20 minutes later, here I am. It's busy. That's right. Where does the Bloodmobile usually go? Uh, so we have mobile blood drives all over the Bay Area and three blood centers, and uh, one in Mountain View, one in Menlo Park, and one in Camp. So let's see, where were we? Oh, yeah. I was about to say that one of the easiest medical procedures you can do to improve your health is to get blood. It's free, and it makes you feel so good about what you've just done. In fact, a common treatment for people with hemochromatosis is to prescribe phlebotomies, where they drain your blood repeatedly to keep your body's iron levels in check. Unfortunately, anemia is much more complicated, and iron supplements can be toxic even to people with anemia. But there is some good news. It's just counterintuitive until you think about it. Many women of YouTube report that ferrous bisglycinate, found in gentle iron supplements, is easier on their stomachs than other forms of iron. These are the only iron pills I've ever found that don't hurt your stomach. I ended up coming to find the Mega Food Blood Builder, which has been by far the best iron. That's good news, but I wanted to find somebody above our pay grades to see if they could explain what's going on behind that and is there even a better source. Andrew James is a very respected professor at Duke who specializes in maternal fetal medicine. I wondered if she spoke above my pay grade. We had a 20-year-old Gravita 1 at 29 weeks with a large left iliofemoral DVT. Okay, that's a yes. But she spent decades of her career being frustrated by oral iron supplements and looking for better supplements that she could explain to the rest of us. I spent years just prescribing oral iron and more oral iron and more oral iron, and sometimes with no effect whatsoever. It turns out the key thing is the amount of elemental iron, and it's not what you expect. Interestingly, the two at the bottom that are touted as the most well-tolerated, well, isn't that interesting? They have the very lowest amount of elemental iron. She cites some compelling research on what makes some supplements work and others not. Increased iron consumption can increase hepcidin, which will block further iron absorption from the gut, and will trap iron in the liver and spleen and result in a decrease in plasma iron. And the result from this study showed that alternate day dosing resulted in 34% greater cumulative iron absorption, which is counterintuitive. The author suggested that low dose iron given on alternate days may maximize absorption, increase efficacy, reduce gastrointestinal distress, and what we were all aiming for, improved compliance. What? We know that women can only absorb between one and three milligrams of iron a day, so how do we get the idea to put these megadoses in the supplements? Ha <laughs> ha, I know the answer. Finally, a question that's not above my pay grade. It's the ghost of Geritol past. Twice the iron and a whole pound of calves liver. Dr. James isn't the only expert I found compelling. There's a professor at Cambridge University who developed a supplement from a form of iron that's actually found in food. Ferrous iron produce free radicals in your intestines. It will impact on your gut microflora. The bad guys tend to prosper, the good guys not so much. And 
it alters your intestinal balance. All of this leads to a range of side effects. Things like nausea, dizziness, you get bloated, and at the extreme, you may even start um, experiencing blood in your feces. Ferric iron, in contrast, is the good guy. This is a type of iron that you get from your food. It will be present in things like greens, vegetables, pulses. However, ferric-based supplements are not very well absorbed. So our research is mostly about copying nature. Nature has found a solution to this problem a long time ago. And that solution is called ferritin. And this is an iron storage protein. And that is quite well absorbed without all of the issues that are associated to supplements, fer supplements. Ferritin is a protein that contains an iron oxide mineral inside. So you've got a protein shell and an iron oxide inside. The shell protects the iron oxide mineral up until the point it gets absorbed into cells. And at that stage, because it's surrounding it, it destabilizes the iron oxide, it allows it to fall apart. And when it falls apart, it releases iron in a way that our body can absorb it. We're quite excited about this. We've had very promising data and hopefully we'll be able to take it to patients as soon as possible. Our hope is that we'll produce something that is as absorbable as ferrous supplements, but as safe as ferric iron supplements. I looked for supplements like that and found Ferritin Plus, which looked promising because it's made from peas and it's a very low dose, 20 milligrams. By the way, the form of iron in Geritol is a pure iron powder called Carbonyl which was developed in the 20s by the electronics company BASF for magnetic recording tape. If you think ingesting free iron is a good idea despite what the experts say, I have some extra nails you can grind up and then bon appetit. By the way, all the books and experts I could find said vegans and vegetarians have a higher incidence of anemia than meat eaters do. Meat eaters still get anemic, but not as much. It's the flip side of iron toxicity as you age. I asked Dr. Clapper, a vegan doctor, about vegans and iron. Hi, how are you? Good, good to see you. You're, yeah, you're looking good as always. Oh, thank you, so are you. It must be something about what you're eating, I guess. I guess, it's, it's, <laughs> a, it's a water. What is the, what's the deal with iron? And, yeah, um, so you know, there's an old saying, you, you aren't what you eat, you are what you absorb. And iron has always been a challenging mineral to absorb. The absorption fraction of the iron that you actually swallow is about 1%. So uh, knowing that, anything that further reduces uh, iron absorption might put a person uh, on the low end of their iron balance. And one of them turns out to be a type of carbohydrate called phytic acid, and the phytates in dark green leafy vegetables, which the plant eaters are encouraged to eat a lot of. And if a person has been eating a whole lot of uh, dark green leafy vegetables, and they're not either well cooked or importantly well chewed. To they you got if you're eating greens, you got to chew them to a cream uh, to break up the cell walls to allow for the iron absorption to happen. The, the insufficient chewing and high phytate diet probably mitigates against a, a huge amounts of iron absorption. But again probably not a bad thing. Too much iron is not a good thing. Iron overload is a known clinical entity and it's not good. Going back to that lowish ferritin level, body probably knows what it's doing. Um, and yes, I see frequently lowish uh, ferritin levels, which is the amount of stored iron in the body. But again, I don't look at it necessarily as a, as a bad thing. That said, uh, you don't want to run short of iron, especially if uh, you are starting to show blood cells that are a little short of hemoglobin. Uh, so what to do, uh, you want to increase the absorption of the iron by a couple maneuvers. Cooking um, the iron-containing foods, making stews and soups with greens and beans and lentils. Uh, as the, the, the plant cells break up, the iron goes into the soup broth and uh, you're able to absorb it there. But also uh, the issue of vitamin C. Now, vitamin C will increase the absorption of iron by about a factor of six times. Does that mean taking a vitamin C tablet when you eat your kale? No, but if you've got a plate of kale or broccoli in front of you, squeeze some lemon juice over it. If you're making spinach salad, throw some mandarin orange slices in there. Get that citrus and greens combination going. Uh, cut up some bell peppers and throw it in your salad with the romaine. For more reading about infants, I recommend the book Nourish by Rishma Shah, a pediatrician, and Brenda Davis, a nutritionist who's her co-author. 
I just can't believe how good that book is. They will talk about how preterm infants are most at risk because a lot of iron gets transferred to the fetus during the third trimester. They cover diet, formula, supplements, tests, etc. They are vegans and believe in raising children vegan, but they're very aware of how critical it is to watch for iron levels and supplement if necessary. For premenopausal women who don't respond well to oral medications even when taken appropriately, there are IV infusions of 1,000 milligrams in one shot. The hematologist whose book I opened with, Joseph Schatzel, has prescribed it for more than 1,000 women with great success. In Andra James's talk, which I'll link in the description, she describes how they're done and how effective they can be. I love reading about your struggles and successes in the comments section, and I know if I got anything wrong, you won't be shy about letting us all know it, and I love that. Thank you so much. And you have to remember that the people who are giving these are taking time out of their day, giving out of the goodness of their heart, doing it for free to generate blood products that we need. And there is always great competition for those blood products. And what I mean is the cardiothoracic surgeons want them, we need them, the gastroenterologists want to use them. And so that there is a finite supply of blood